Hi, everyone. I am happy to welcome you to TrueCode's first webinar of 2021. Uh, this is Sharon Byron from TrueCode. We're excited you can join us for today's presentation, which will examine documentation and coding challenges uh, for the 2021 ICD-10 CM uh, and PCS updates. I'm joined today by Susan Gatehouse, founder and CEO of Axia Solutions, and Brenda Ray, Director of Operations at Axia. TrueCode offers these complimentary educational webinars on a variety of topics throughout the year, and they're all accredited by AHIMA. You can check out our website to see our full lineup for the year and uh, sign up to receive notifications about future webinars. If you're not familiar with TrueCode, we offer an encoder application that's used by hundreds of hospitals, consulting firms, and payers. Um, we really pride ourselves on helping organizations improve coding accuracy and productivity um, with our easy-to-use software. So if um, you've considered making an encoder switch, or even if you're just curious to see how we could benefit your organization, we'd love to show you what makes us unique, and we invite you to join an upcoming uh, demonstration. You can register for those on our website. Okay, now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. Susan Gatehouse, as I mentioned, is the founder and CEO of Axia Solutions. Susan established Axia in 1998, and she partners with healthcare organizations across the nation to craft solutions for unique challenges in the dynamic world of healthcare reimbursement and data management. Brenda Ray is the Director of Operations at Axia. She has over three decades of experience providing specialty services, including random and focused quality reviews, compliance and denial management, revenue cycle management, and various industry education training. Brenda has worked with numerous organizations facilitating homegrown coder programs and has cross-trained coders within multiple service lines. Before I hand it over to Susan and Brenda, I just want to review a few housekeeping items to make sure um, everyone has a successful webinar. First, all attendees are in listen-only mode, which means you'll need to use your control panel to communicate. This is on the right-hand side of your screen. If it's in the way, you can minimize that to see um, the full presentation, and you can do that by um, collapsing and expanding it with the little red box with the arrow. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do that in the questions section. Um, just click on the little plus button. That will open up a text box, and you can type your question. We will try to answer questions at the end, uh, but if we do not have time, feel free to still send your questions in, and um, we'll get them to Susan and Brenda, and we can follow up with answers uh, via email. And there are handouts also for today's presentation. Those can be accessed in the handouts section. Um, they were also emailed in some reminder emails yesterday and today, so hopefully you had a chance to see those. And lastly, um, I just want to make sure everyone knows how to receive their CEU certificate. Tomorrow, we will be sending out an email to all attendees, and that will contain a link to a brief webinar evaluation. Once you complete that, you'll be able to download your CEU certificate. Uh, that email will also contain a link to the recording of this presentation, as well as handouts. Um, if you're listening to this webinar on demand at a later time, uh, directions will also be provided at the end of the webinar for how you can obtain your CEU. And if you have any questions or any problems, you can always email me just by replying to any of your webinar invitations. Those will come to me, and I will make sure you get what you need. Okay, with that, I am going to hand it over to Susan. Susan, take it away. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you all for participating in this afternoon's webinar on um, chronic kidney disease, as well as some of the, the challenging or gray areas with the new ICD-10 CM CPT updates we've just chosen a few to talk about today, but thank you TrueCode. I've always admired the, the individuals working there as well as the owners in the product. I just think it's a, a really good product and such a good opportunity. They allow educational opportunities for their clients. So thank you, Sharon. Um, with that said, we'll move right into the presentation. Quick disclaimer here, as we all can probably agree, codes change, especially this year. They seem to have changed at a very rapid pace. So please don't take this webinar material and expect it to support you throughout the whole year. It would be great if it did, but just check your dates because it only stays, stays as current as, as our situation that we're currently in. The learning objectives for today is we're really going to dig into stage three chronic, chronic kidney disease as it relates to documentation, as it relates to the coding guidelines 
and it wants to really understand the anatomy and physiology of the coder would need to understand it. And clinical, to support clinical documentation improvement, support the clinical documentation improvement team, and also just provide the ability to really transfer a lot of knowledge as far as what's required from a documentation perspective. Also want to transfer knowledge in terms of COVID-19, the CM and PCS codes that were released January 2021. As we know, COVID and the codes and the coding guidelines have changed like the weather. Um, so we're just really going to hone in on what was expected as of January 1 and why. Also, we pulled out a couple of gray areas that we did receive clarification on this year in, with the new changes, and that's related to drug use and drug withdrawals, as well as applying the appropriate GCS scale or coma score and, and what conditions need to be present. And as Sherry had mentioned previously, we're going to discuss or just have a 10-minute demo, so to speak, really discuss some learning opportunities online for those that are interested. So um, as far as chronic kidney disease, according to the Health People's 2020 Public Health Initiative, chronic kidney disease has become a public health concern in the United States. Not only uh, not only chronic kidney disease, but if you think about it, diabetes and hypertension follow closely along with that with chronic kidney disease. So as a coder, as a clinician, it is important to document specifically the conditions or the elements of this condition that are needed to transfer the, the knowledge, again, as far as the severity of a chronic kidney disease patient. It's important for coders to understand the coding guidelines, obviously, and to be able to communicate those guidelines as clinical documentation improvement staff have to coordinate and collaborate with the physician. It is true. With the um, with your kidney, if one stops working, the other one does compensate. The human body is a fascinating thing. Um, also, from the perspective of just looking at the kidney, if you were to look at someone's back, the kidney is really housed from T12 to L3 in an adult. So it's there's one on each side, really housed under the ribs. And if you think about the the size of it, the size of it it runs from about T12 to T13. So it's not I wouldn't say it's huge. I would definitely say it's a, a very extremely important organ. It's, a, I think, a workhorse organ. I think it is a very vulnerable organ, too. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to talk about specifically is, is how, what does it do and how vulnerable is it and why? So with chronic kidney disease, we, or we, let's just say kidney disease in general. We know that the patient's kidney function has been compromised and the overall function of the kidney to really bring it up to the, the treetop level approach, the main function of the kidney is to eliminate waste, to eliminate toxins. So it's the, it's the great equalizer. I think of it as it wants to promote, the kidney wants to promote homeostasis as far as water regulation. Do you have enough water? Are you dehydrated? Blood pressure. Is your blood pressure high? Is your blood pressure low? And that does, does coincide with kidney function. And we'll talk specifically about that. Also, it activates vitamin D, so it helps your body absorb calcium and your bones absorb what needs to be absorbed. We know that it eliminates waste as far as uric acid, urea. It also, if you think about the great equalizer, it balances the electrolytes. So if you think about it from the standpoint of the calcium, sodium, calcium, all of those are such significant indicators of if they're out of balance, arrhythmia typically occurs. So it, it does apply to the heart, too, as far as its function and its support to the heart. It also can release a product that tells the body it's time to produce more red blood cells. So it can also affect your oxygen as well. So just to, to drive home the fact what your kidney does in its normal state and then what starts to happen when we look at kidney disease, so to speak. So Again, this is the cross section of the, the kidney. So it's a good visual for you all to look at. Now this is the, the frontal view. But again, if you look at the back view, you kind of have an idea of the visual that I gave you as far as where the kidney's located. Moving into a more detailed um, function of the kidney is rec referred to as glomerular filtration. So I'm gonna break that down a bit 
the glomeruli are part of the kidney. Now, again, the kidney's function is to filtrate. So we have nephrons in our kidney, and this is somewhat of a small picture, but these nephron or these uh, the nephrons in the kidney are a long set of tubes where urine's made, and it, it produces over, I think there are over one million uh, tubules, tubular glomeruli that make urine. The urine drains into the collecting ducts and is excreted, but during that process, the glomerulus, which you can kind of see here, if you think about it, it is tiny clusters. And when I say tiny, tiny, tiny clusters of blood capillaries inside the nephron. So if you think about clusters of, of capillaries inside a tubule, think about it from the standpoint of what if the patient has plaque buildup because of heart disease? Or what if, um, well, plaque buildup is the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, that can certainly affect the blood flow, the ability to filter, so it could affect the heart. So this just gives a good example of how the two really coincide, or the kidney coincides with actually a lot of different areas of the body. You'll hear me talk mainly about the heart um, and diabetes. But again, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, I would be remiss, I think, not to talk about acute renal failure. We know acute's not chronic, but I do want to point out, because there has been a lot of confusion in the past, acute renal failure is acute renal failure. It is the same code as acute kidney injury. What I want to point out is there's been confusion about acute kidney injury with the thought of injury means external. It doesn't have to be external. It can be an insult to the kidney through... Um, say the patient had a virus and became very dehydrated or for whatever reason missed several uh, hemodialysis appointments then, uh, or dialysis appointments, and that can drive the reason for the patient to go into acute renal failure. It codes the same code, AKI and ARF, which I would not recommend using that abbreviation because it could be mistaken for acute respiratory failure, Believe it or not, even with the signs and symptoms being they are, there are records that are still denied for that reason. Renal failure is a popular one. But just to make note, if there is a reason for, or there, there is a reason for the acute kidney injury, was an insult, was the patient dehydrated, what was the reason for the injury? Those are items that you want to document as well if they are not signs and symptoms. So just be aware of that. Chronic kidney disease is five different stages or can be referred to as four, and we'll go through those, but it's really the progression. It's an indicator of how long the patient's had the disease and the progression of the disease, and you'll see the code numbers that that uh, falls within. And an end-stage renal disease is just that. There's it's permanent damage to the kidney that does require dialysis or a transplant. So end-stage is kind of a depressing word so to speak, but there is no turning around with end-stage as far as from a, a medical perspective other than dialysis and, um, or a transplant. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with stage three kidney disease, what I think is so important to drive home, and what you'll see this in the following slide, with chronic kidney disease, stage three, there is a very large population of patients with chronic kidney disease that fall within stage three. So from a data perspective, it was felt by clinicians that it would be in the best interest of a patient if they were able to realize that the patient has moved from CKD2 to CK3, CKD3, tongue twister, where they are in that process. Did they just move into to chronic kidney disease three? Or are they are are they past it? Are they considered you know severe um, chronic kidney disease, which which would be chronic kidney disease three B? The code's going to tell us that. But because there's such a large population that falls within this category, what um, what's been stated from the, the National Center of Vital Health Statistics is let's capture these patients. Let's capture which ones are in stage three. Maybe they can't be cured, but we can either stop the progression of the disease or we can um, prevent the progression at a rapid pace. So that's the reason why stage three is broken out into stage three A and stage three B is because of the GFR rate. 
So the GFR rate is the most single predictor, predictor of the function of the kidney for chronic kidney disease. So you'll find here, um, we've already talked about the, it's the best measure for kidney function, how the blood passes through the glomeruli, the creatinine. If a patient's in acute renal failure, you'll find that they really focus on creatinine, urine output, where if they're in chronic kidney disease, the focus is more on the filtration rate or GFR, which is typically located in your lab, but you'll find here all the stages. So as I stated earlier, your GFR range, the higher the range, the lower, uh, the better your kidney's functioning. So the lower the range of rates, your kidney is not functioning as well. So you can see there's roughly 18,000 patients in this study that fall within stage three. But flipping back on the previous slide, you'll see that stage A or stage 3A and stage 3B take into consideration of a different uh, GFR rate. So stage three is 45 to 59. Stage 3B is 30 to 44. So just make note of that as you look through the rates and as far as the GFR rates that will be in your lab and, and will be helpful in determining, if nothing else, if the physician doesn't tie the two together, it would be a great way to support a query if, if there's a question as far as the staging goes. Stage 3A and stage 3B, again, I'm giving you the codes here. Uh, as far as moderate, and we want to really stay out of the N18.30 category, stage three unspecified, and then there's also A and B, and you'll see how it, how that falls out into categories specifically as far as what's been placed in the various stages. So hopefully that will be helpful to you as you move through. So with that said, what I would love to do is Brenda, I will turn it over to you. Let me just get the controls here so you can get started. Okay, so Brenda, if you want to get started, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Susan. That was lots of great information, so thank you for sharing. Um, today, I would like to talk about the COVID-related codes effective January 1. So in response to the public health emergency that was declared for COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC has implemented six new ICD-10-CM diagnosis codes, 21 new ICD-10-PCS procedure codes, and then they updated the MSDRG version 38.1. Again, we're only focusing today on those COVID-related codes that became effective January 1 of this year. So on this slide, you'll see that uh, in response to the PHE for COVID-19, that the CDC implemented six new diagnosis codes into the ICD-10-CM classification system effective January 1. And those six codes are on your screen, J12.82 for pneumonia due to COVID specifically, uh, M35.81, which is your multi-system inflammatory syndrome, M35.89, other specified systemic involvement of connective tissue. And then we have three new Z codes. Z11.52 is your encounter specifically for COVID screening. Z20.822, contact with and suspected exposure specifically to COVID-19. And then Z86.16 is a personal history of COVID-19. Now, although we have the new screening code, Z11.52 for COVID, um, we will not be using that code as long as we are within the PHE or the pandemic is still active. The code is there, but it's not available at this time for us to use for any type of screening. Um, however, if the patient does come in and they do a COVID screening as part of a pre-op testing, then we have to revert back to code new code Z80.822, uh, the contact with and suspected exposure to COVID-19. Okay, these are the new diagnoses that we just mentioned, and you will see which ones are assigned MCC and CC assignment. So the only MCC is the pneumonia due to, co due to COVID. 
and those are assigned to 193, 194, 195 MSDRG, and those are your simple pneumonias with or without CCMCC. It's also assigned to 974, 75, and 76, which is the HIV with major related conditions with or without CCMCC. The uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome and the other systemic involvement of connective tissue codes, the two M codes, are both assigned as a CC, and they both are assigned to M MSDRG 545, 546, and 547, and those are your connective tissue disorders with or without CC, MCC. And then lastly, the three Z codes um, are not assigned as a CC, MCC, obviously, and they are assigned to the 951 MSDRG, which is other factors influencing I'm sorry, but I believe we've lost audio. Are you able to hear me? Sharon, I'm able to hear it. I believe um, that Brenda may have lost audio. She is dialing back in. I can move forward with the presentation um, if, if need be. If everybody would just be patient for just a moment, our speaker will be right back with you. You might want to go ahead, and then once she gets on, we can let her take over. Okay. I don't have control of the presentation, so if you if you do, Sharon, if you could place it on 15, slide 15, that would be great. I'm sorry. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. I am so sorry. I don't know what happened. It just dropped. My apologies. No worries. We'll just pick up where we left off. Okay. So uh, these are your COVID-19, you got to go back to the monoclonal antibodies. I'm trying to. There you are. Okay. Okay. okay, here we go. My apologies, everyone. So, COVID 19 therapeutics for monoclonal antibodies, as you can see on the screen, um, the C CMS has actually implemented 21 new procedure codes to describe the introduction or infusion of these therapeutics, which include the monoclonal antibodies and and vaccines that we'll also talk about for the treatment of COVID-19 effective January 1. So my first question is when I first started looking at this information is what are monoclonal antibodies? So the FDA describes them as laboratory made proteins that mimic the immune system's ability to fight off harmful antigens such as viruses. So they are specifically directed against the spike protein of SARS COVID-2 designed to block the virus's attachment and entry into human cells. So authorizing these monoclonal 
antibody therapies may help outpatients avoid hospitalization and alleviate the burden on healthcare systems because when these particular therapies were implemented, of course, we did not have a vaccine at that time, but we really needed help with uh, alleviating some of that burden on the healthcare system. So um, these antibody treatments were were developed. So the criteria for receiving this kind of therapeutic treatment is uh, it's an outpatient treatment, meaning it's not for people who are in the hospital with COVID or who are expected to need to be hospitalized. People have to take it within 10 days of symptom onset, and the sooner the better. It's available for people who are 65 and older or people who are between 55 and 64 who have certain medical conditions like hypertension or people between 18 and 54 who have certain medical conditions like diabetes. So these treatments are allowed by the FDA under an emergency use authorization while clinical studies continue to look at their usefulness and safety. All of the new PCS codes effective January 1 that you see here are classified in the table XW0. Um, these codes specify the substance name and then the route of operation as you, the route of operation, the route of administration as you can see highlighted in the middle column and then of course the approach. So the XWO codes, as you all, XW0 codes describe the new technology codes that are only assigned when used to treat COVID-19. So there's four specific substances listed here. Uh, they have new PCS codes to track their use in treating COVID-19. One of them is administered by the sub, by subcutaneous injection, which is the one on the top. And then the others are substances are administered via IV infusion. So you want to make sure to review that documentation very carefully for the type of monoclonal antibody and, of course, the route of administration as well for accurate coding. So per CVS COVID-19 um, frequently asked questions, CMS anticipates that the monoclonal antibody products to treat COVID-19 will initially be given to healthcare providers at no charge. Medicare will not pay for the antibody products to treat COVID-19. When, they when the providers receive it for free, but will provide payment for the infusion or the administration of the product during the COVID-19 PHE when furnished consistent with the emergency use authorization. So when healthcare providers begin to purchase these antibody products, CMS anticipates setting the Medicare payment rate at that time. The same way it anticipates setting the payment rates for the COVID-19 vaccines when administered in a hospital inpatient setting, which is based on a reasonable cost. So note that Medicare pays for these antibody products under the COVID-19 benefit, and therefore these products are not eligible for the new COVID-19 treatments add-on payment under the IPPS. That was a lot of information I know on that one slide, but I thought it was crucial to understand what the antibodies are, what they do, and then the appropriate uh, code assignments based on, on um, the route of operation as well as the name of the drug or the name of the therapy. I don't know why there seems to be a lag time on my end. I apologize for the slide changing. Okay. Now we're going to look at um, other new technology therapeutics for COVID-19. <laughs> My slide is doing its own thing. There are uh, three nonspecific monoclonal antibody codes that were added to allow tracking of other monoclonal antibody drugs approved for treatment of COVID-19 in the coming months. So these are placeholders, if you will, for new technologies for monoclonal antibodies that are that could be coming down the pike in the future.
Okay, these are other drug classes. Uh, there's two separate substances here, or two specific substances here. The drug uh, baricitinib, and then an immuno immunomodulator drug known as CD24FC. Uh, these are also new codes for tracking for COVID-19 therapies. The baricitinib recently received FDA emergency use authorization as a treatment for COVID in combination with remdesivir. Uh, baricitinib can be administered only orally or via gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube. The immunomodulator substance designated as CD24FC is administered via IV infusion. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, baricitinib drug is an oral drug. That was the how it was manufactured originally. It's a JAK inhibitor, and it was used to treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis. It interferes with the inflammatory processes within the immune system that lead to the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. But on November 19, 2020, there was an emergency use authorization issued by the FDA that it could be used in combination with remdesivir for the treatment of suspected or lab-confirmed COVID-19 in hospitalized patients who were age greater than two years who require supplemental oxygen, invasive mechanical ventilation, or ECMO. The results of the ACTT2 trial, which is adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial, reveal that this combination, these two drugs combined, reduced recovery time in these critical patients. So an immunomodulator is defined as a chemical agent that modifies the immune response or the functioning of the immune system as by stimulating uh, the antibody formation or the in inhibition of the white blood cell activity. So again, these treatments designated as new technology by the X XWO classification in the PS PCS system, um, the codes are, are assigned only when used to treat COVID-19, only. So provider documentation must specify the appropriate route of administration and accurate code assignment is very important in tracking the clinical outcomes associated with these types of treatments. All right, well, now we're going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, there were six new PCS codes added here for tracking uh, for COVID-19 vaccinations while a patient is in the hospital. Of course, the vast majority of vaccines, as you all know, will not be administered to patients while they are in the hospital. Nevertheless, these PCS codes will allow for the data to be captured on an inpatient record. The new PCS codes specify whether the vaccine was a subcutaneous or intramuscular injection. As you'll see in the middle column with the, high, the uh, black bold, and whether the injection was a dose one or dose two, which you see in the red highlights for vaccines that require two injections to complete the therapy. These would be a vaccine series. The codes that do not specify a dose are to be used for single dose vaccines or when information regarding the dose is not available in the medical record. Again, provider documentation of the dose and route of administration are crucial to accurate reporting of these codes. Uh, you know, we can see this being a potential compliance issue with the federal government regarding the specific documentation needed to accurately code and track dose one and dose two in a vaccine series. So the documentation is crucial to meeting all the compliance requirements. So there's a great opportunity here to be proactive in performing a maybe a snapshot audit to determine that the specific documentation requirements are being met as well as the PCS codes are being assigned appropriately. So although these PCS codes are designated non-OR and do not impact the DRG assignment, accurate code assignment is very important in tracking the clinical outcomes associated with the use of these vaccines. Data-driven. Okay, now, um, we're going to talk about the Medicare billing for COVID-19 vaccine shot administration. So when COVID-19 vaccine doses are provided by the government without charge, which we just mentioned, only bill for the vaccine administration. Don't include 
the vaccine codes on the claim when the vaccines are free. I apologize in the lag time for my slides. Okay, the ICD-10 MSCRG version 38.1 effective January 1, as we've already mentioned, the new PCS codes are designated 90R and they will not affect DRG assignment. And then CMS does note in their announcement at on their website at cms.gov under MSCRG classifications and software, for hospitalized patients, Medicare pays for the COVID-19 vaccines and their administration separately from the DRG rate. As such, Medicare expects that the appropriate CPT codes will be used when a Medicare beneficiary is administered a vaccine while a hospital inpatient. And we're not gonna talk about CPT codes today, we're just talking about PCS, but just remember that is reimbursable uh, as far as the administration goes with a CPT code. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the fiscal year 2021 ICD-10-CM code and guideline updates effective 10-1. Uh, there was a new code set that was added for withdrawal from alcohol use or abuse. There was also a revised guideline for coma scale and also a new guideline added for screening for COVID-19. Okay, let's talk a little bit about a little bit about the withdrawal syndrome in substance use and abuse. And this is from ICD-10 CM PCS Coding Clinic fourth quarter, 2020, pages 16 to 17. Um, substance withdrawal can occur in clinical situations involving individuals who do not have a diagnosis of substance dependence, but they do use substances regularly and then suddenly stop using them. Such situations would include individuals who are physiologically addicted to a substance but do not have the behavioral elements required for a diagnosis of substance dependence when taking a prescribed medication as directed. And individuals with a diagnosis of substance abuse who lack the loss of control required for a diagnosis of dependence. So previously it was believed that withdrawal syndrome only developed clinically in individuals with substance dependence. But we, we now know that um, that's not the case and so these new codes have been, have been created for us. So on the next slide, you'll see that there are, uh, there were 21 new codes for substance disorders in chapter five, mental, behavioral, and neurodevelopmental disorders which will allow the capture of substance withdrawal, whether the status is use, abuse, or dependence. So for example, these are the new codes on the screen for alcohol abuse and use with withdrawal. And you'll see the first four are for alcohol abuse, and then you have the withdrawal component, either uncomplicated or specifically withdrawal delirium, withdrawal with perceptual disturbance, or withdrawal unspecified. And then the last four are for alcohol use, and then you have the same withdrawal component, either uncomplicated, delirium with perceptual disturbance or an unspecified withdrawal. So prior to the new code edition, alcohol withdrawal was categorized as alcohol dependence uh, by default. So ICD-10-CM did not classify alcohol withdrawal with alcohol abuse at all. So we were instructed in coding clinic first quarter 2018 to code only alcohol abuse and do not assign a code for withdrawal um, if the physician confirmed that it was indeed alcohol abuse and not dependent. So there are also other substances that have expanded in this code set to allow the capture of substance withdrawal for use and abuse, and that, that includes opioids, cannabis, sedatives, hypnotics, or anxiolytics, cocaine, other stimulants, and other psychoactive substances, which can cause the physiological addiction and have potential for development of withdrawal syndrome when a person reduces or ceases the use of the substance. So just be aware of the new codes for the substance use, abuse, or dependence with withdrawal now that we have those options. 
which are found in the code categories F01 through F99. So the, the, on the next slide, we'll talk about the um, coding guideline for the coma scale. And this was kind of a surprise to a lot of people because, as you all know, when there's an update or a change or revision to the ICD-10-CM uh, coding guidelines for coding and reporting, usually in the index you will see either an underline or a bold, and that indicates that there, there's been a change within the, that specific guideline. Well, coma scale was not bolded or underlined or anything in the index, so this was discovered actually um, by accident, and you can see on the left the new update, the new updated guideline for 2021, and then on the right you see the update, the guideline for 2020, and the strike throughs are what was removed from that guideline in 2021. So per AHA Central Office, because they this question was written into them is we were not aware that this guideline had changed and their response was the coma scale guideline has been revised so that the coma scale codes are reverted back to their original intent of being used just for traumatic brain injury only. So a few years back the guidance expanded to allow the usage of the coma scale codes for non-traumatic conditions as you all know as some providers were using the coma scale to describe their assessment of the central nervous system. So, but however, over time, AHA received many questions from coders that were confused when they tried to apply the codes to non-traumatic situations. So the cooperating parties decided to roll back the codes to their original intent. So while providers may continue to use the coma scale to assess non-traumatic brain injury conditions for internal purposes or for internal tracking, the ICD-10-CM code should not be reported for non-traumatic circumstances. And on the next screen, we'll talk about um, the new guideline that's in, in the 2021 guidelines for screening for COVID. And we all know that during the pandemic, a screening code is generally not appropriate. So the instruction is do not code the Z1152 while we are still within a an active pandemic status. So that's why uh, coding guidance will be updated as new information concerning any changes in the pandemic status becomes available. So we'll be um, informed as to when this code will be available for use at some point in the near future, we hope. And then lastly, on the last slide, we'll talk about, we've, we had some um, input from uh, one of our clients or a couple of our clients that has a billing change um, with Z20.822 versus Z20.828. Some of the payers are requiring that the claim be split billed by the year uh, when these two codes appear. So if you see at the top Z20.828, which is contact with and exposure to other viral communicable diseases was effective for the year of 2020. And then January 1, the new code, Z20.822, contact with an exposure to COVID-19, became effective for January 1. So an example is a patient has a pre-op testing done, including a COVID screening, on 12-31-20. The patient has outpatient surgery on 1-5-21. The claim dates are 12-31-20 to 1-5-21, which includes the pre-op testing and the outpatient procedure on one claim. So the coder correctly assigns the Z20.822 based on the claim discharge date of 2021. However, the Z20.822 edits as an invalid code on this claim with a discharge date 2021 due to the date of service the COVID test is 2020. So with the COVID test being 2020, you would have to split out that 2020 charge with your um, Z20.828 and then a separate claim for your 2021 charges specifically to avoid that edit. Okay, and then lastly, of course, the resource page that gives you all the resources used to prepare um, and just all this information. So I hope you found it helpful. And again, I apologize for the um, technical difficulties, but we survived.
thank you. Susan, I'll toss it back to you. Okay, thank you, Brenda. And I think everybody can understand with bandwidth issues, with kids being at home, we can all um, all relate to some degree. So thank you for the information. And it, there will be a PDF to, to follow this presentation for those of you that may have missed anything. I did notice in the, the comments there was a lot of audio issues. So um, there will be the ability to tap into the, the presentation. With that said, Sharon, if you want to go over the procedure that the um, attendees should follow in terms of the CEUs. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so everyone, you can hopefully see on the screen a URL which has, um, uh, this is basically the link that you need to obtain your CEU. It's the link to an evaluation. It's a very brief evaluation, and once you submit that, you'll be able to download your certificate. I want to mention the link is not live yet, so don't try to go to it yet because it won't be live until 3 o'clock. So um, this is really for the folks viewing the recording to have this as a reference. Um, they'll be able to obtain their CEU that way, but I'll also be sending out this in an email. Tomorrow morning, you'll get instructions for obtaining your CEU. You'll get the recording. You'll get the handout. Um, uh, stay tuned for that. 